um, so today I'll be presenting on a paper um, Kristen recommended as just an overview of spatial transcriptomics. Um, so it's called The Promise of Spatial Tran Transcriptomics for Neuroscience in the Era of Molecular Cell Typing. Um, okay, so I guess just before we jump into the paper, um, I guess the reason I wanted to read this paper um, is I'm pretty new to new to the field of spatial transcriptomics, and like I said, it was recommended as sort of a general overview. And um, so for me, I just wanted to like clarify just some of the basics. Um, so just like what is spatial transcriptomics? What are some of the common lab laboratory methods performed? Um, what kind of questions can we answer by performing spatial spatial methods? Um, and then kind of like what does what does the data look like? So um, some of this might, might be, a lot of this might be obvious to some of us um, who've done more with spatial, but hopefully it's like a good, um, going through this paper will be a good review for some of um, for the rest of us. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna jump right into the paper um, and sort of go through it in the order things are presented. Um, try to summarize like what I got out of it. Um, so basically they start with talking about like um, using transcriptomics to define um, cell types. So saying, okay, molecular techniques have offered a new way to stratify neuron types by the genes they express. Um, and then of course, since the transcriptome is a reflection of the um, gene regu regulatory state and then therefore cellular, cell cellular phenotype, it can be used um, to understand how um, cell lineage and cell diversity. Um, and um, so then when they talk about using transcriptomics to define cell type, they mention this thing called, that they call the correspondence problem. So um, I guess using the definition of cell type based on gene expression um, and then relating that back to like more traditional definitions of cell type using like morphology, um, electrical properties, connectivity, function, and function. Um, okay, and then they talked about this, what they call multiplexing. And that was like a, a term that kind of, I had to look up because I wasn't sure what they meant with, when, they, when they were using it. Um, so I guess in this context, they were just saying like multiplexing is just being able to measure a lot of transcripts simultaneously um, in the lab. That, that was my understanding at least. Um, so they, they present like the different methods using um, different like hybridization and barcoding schemes. And first one they present is um, singular, single molecule fluorescent in situ hybridization. So basically, um, taking pr probes that are um, that sort of bind to the target RNA molecule, and then they can be imaged. They or images are produced based on like the fluorescence patterns, um, which are then, um, I guess, like the brightness is used as a measurement of um, how genes are expressed. Um, so like. Um, um, they go to sort of compare different limitations of different methods. So in this case, they were saying um, this method is actually really good with at least detection sensitivity. And um, that can be applied to tissue sections. Um, um, next, I guess I didn't really highlight this, but it's somewhat important. Um, they describe different methods for like what kinds of barcodes you can use and they compared two different things. Um, first, spectral barcoding. Um, so like the barcodes consist of fluorophores. So, um, and use, they use that as a method of labeling. Um, and then they also talk about temporal barcoding. So like they do this um, hybridization and then stripping and then rehybridizing -hybrid, um, over and over again so that you get different like, um, you can use 
barcodes multiple times as a method to like sort of increase how many, as I understood it, at least increase how many transcripts you can sort of um, measure because you get more different unique combinations of barcodes. Um, and, but they also mentioned that a limitation of that is that you get like false negative hybridization. So you miss some of, um, miss some measurements and um, also that tissues can move um, to create some error. And then they go on to like say, um, well, this method called multiplexed error robust fish um, changes the way barcodes work so that they're a little bit more redundant um, so that errors can be um, corrected basically if they occur in one area. Um, um, and then uh, some of the details I was a little less comfortable with, but so I'm, I'm basically just going to try to go through and um, talk about the big picture as I understood it. Um, I guess they also mentioned another limitation of this method is um, that like it really only detects longer transcripts. Um, um, okay, so then they, they compare sort of like the barcode type methods with directly um, sequencing RNA. Um, so like one of the methods that they describe for that is called FISSEQ. Um, so fluorescent in-situ sequ sequencing um, instead of hybridization. Um, and I guess a limitation is that it's, you can't detect that many transcripts. Um, uh, um, and also like when you use, I guess, um, when there are a lot of genes present, they sort of have to compete for, um, for the space. Um, and then they became difficult to read when genes, when molecules overlap. Um, so then they also just like sort of discuss this idea of expansion microscopy, um, sort of, as I understood, like sp spread things out so that it can be measured um, without so much overlap. Um, and again, they go, they talk again about the correspondence problem of like, um, using these transcript um, transcriptome measurements um, and comparing them back to other measures of like what the, what's the type of cells um, are being measured. Um, another thing they talk about is sort of connecting back this information with um, different types of studies. So, so like um, if they want to do analysis of like behavioral responses, um, in vivo, um, they talk about how it, ideally you'd want to be able to um, connect like this, the information gained from spatial transcriptomic analysis um, on the same tissues that you did like this behavioral analysis on. Um, since obviously you can't do spatial, you, you, with spatial you have like tissues. Um, so obviously that has to be done in vitro. Um, so that's one of the things they talk about. Um, um, they mentioned this particular challenge with human brain samples, uh, mentioning that certain pigments, I guess, are uh, are autofluorescent. So I guess they are just bright by themselves, uh, and then that presents a challenge because, like, if you if if you're trying to use fluorescent markers to um, as like the basis of how you're measuring where transcripts are. Um, obviously, if you have other sources of brightness that, that's, that can like drown out the signal. And it's especially challenging since it's not gonna like lipofusin is not gonna be evenly distributed, different cell types. So you're gonna have like um, sort of a skewed representation of what cells are present. Then they mentioned like, okay, well, you can use this thing called Sudan black dye to partially suppress this effect, but um, it's still sort of an issue. Um, and going back to like defining cell types by what genes are expressed, they say, they mentioned that maybe several hundred, like on that sort of order might be sufficient to 
describe these cell types. So that was interesting. Um, and like in the next section of the paper, they is it's more like I guess um, applications and then computational um, challenges. So we mentioned that like a lot of this, um, a lot of these methods generate images as data, and um, then one of the key things that people like to do is detect like features in the image, so like cells, nuclei, vessels, tissue borders that kind of thing. And then they mention how that's sort of like deep learning is really good at that kind of thing, classifying images um, based on what feature, features are present. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, they also mention um, using algorithms to sort of select which genes you'd like to measure in order to like optimally determine cell types. Um, also interesting. Um, you also talk about like human brain samples. Um, I guess large samples are a challenge. Um, okay. Something a bit different in this last section was um, talking about how you might use spatial transcript transcriptomics to track like um, I guess like cellular events that occur, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I guess they go into a little bit of that, but I was I was kind of unsure of the details. But I guess basically they induce specific RNAs in response to certain cellular events, and then those things can be measured in order to sort of infer a cell's um, lineage, and then also just like um, different things that occur in development in general. Um, um, I guess they also talk about like using, um, trying to determine like connections between neurons with trans, uh, spatial transcriptomics. And they say like, that I guess a more traditional method was using like actually measuring like electrical patterns. Um, stuff like that, but that in theory, especially for transcriptomics, um, could like, you could generate a, a matrix of connections between each cell that was being measured, um, which sounds useful. Um, what's the next thing? At the end, they um, sort of talk about applications. So in this case, they were saying like, okay, well, specifically spatial, like single cell RNA-seq. Um, in this example, reviewed, uh, revealed that like in disease, uh, microglia were um, sort of activated um, in certain regions called like beta amyloid plaques. Um, so this is like an example of like in specific regions there's um, something going on in cells. So obviously spatial is like single cell RNA-seq is able to reveal this kind of thing. And um, it was highly like associated with the development of Alzheimer's, which is kind of cool. Um, and I assume at like Libra we're doing similar kinds of things um, that I don't know the details of, but yeah. Um, and really that was like, everything I got out of it. Um, if I <laughs> misdescribe something, people can feel free to correct me. Um, but that's what I got out of it. Um, but yeah.